My name is Jack LeDrew. Ever since I was a kid, the thought of getting a normal job seemed like the strangest, most distasteful thing in the world. So from the time I was 16, I went the other way, traveling around the country, hiking, climbing, paying my way through temp gigs in the outdoors, then teaching all those skills to other people. Finally, I began to get around the world any way I could. I fought oil fires, I got on the crew of a disastrous expedition to bring up a sunken ship from the bottom of the Mediterranean. I even tried to join the French Foreign Legion. By the time I was 30, I felt like a full-time adventurer. Sure, I made ends meet in some pretty mundane ways when I had to, but it always felt like my life was being lived in the times when I was on a quest somewhere. And there have been a lot of those, always biding my time till the next reckless journey. That was me. At some point, like a lot of people with my same curiosity about remote places and strange experiences, I came across the story of the Tajikistan air crash. On October 17, 1992, a plane headed for the capital city of Dushanbe had been hijacked by a Pamiri gunman demanding a prisoner release in gorno and the plane quickly went down in the Pamir Mountains. 29 people on board, two pilots, two crew, 25 passengers, 14 of them relief workers. It took nine days just for the plane to be spotted out there in territory that remote. The scandal came when no one wanted to attempt a rescue. There were dubious reasons for this. Spotters claimed the plane was basically unreachable, they could see glimpses of what was left of it from the air, but saw no evidence of survivors, with the cost and difficulty of reaching them judged untenable. More importantly, the location of the hijacking brought on very real political problems. A civil war had broken out in Tajikistan the previous May, and the country was descending into chaos. The Lenina bodies, who were still calling some of the shots, cried poverty, and any international aid effort or internal military assistance fell apart in a quagmire of politics. Even though there had been three Americans on board, the U.S. decided to stay out of the fray. Months passed. The war went on, and because the region was so desolate, the plain remained isolated at about 6,000 feet, 20 miles west of Ismail Simoni, the highest mountain peak in the country. No survivors ever crawled through the wilderness to be recovered. Months became years. Reporters and dark-hearted thrill-seekers who may have wanted to get up there couldn't get past the border restrictions. It wasn't until 1997 that the region's politics began to settle. For five years, in a tragic diplomatic failure, Flight 70 had remained in the mountains. An eerie but unseen anomaly on the landscape. Everyone on it declared dead. Satellite photos depicted shattered and burned remnants from odd and indistinct angles. The crash area was rocky and steep and half-scraped of trees by harsh winds. That place never left my mind after I read about it for the first time. And so when I did a deep dive into the political situation in Tajikistan... I realized something I think a lot of other people had missed. That by 1998, it had become safe enough for an individual with the right mountaineering skills to reach the plane, for whatever reason they might want to. But the powers that be were apparently content to let the crash lie forever. Recovery operations hadn't exactly gotten any cheaper in five years. I'll be completely honest and give you the breakdown of my fascination with the crash site. A third of it was glory. I wanted to be the first person to post photos of the site. A third of it was the novelty. I would be completely alone and doing something no one else had the guts or the willingness to do. The last third of my interest was morbid curiosity. I was 37 in the summer of 1998, when the relative political ease of getting deep into the Pamirs would, for the first time, combine with acceptable weather conditions to make reaching that plane truly possible. I was so paranoid someone else would have the idea first that I didn't mention it to anyone until three days before I flew from LaGuardia Airport to Tokyo, Tokyo to New Delhi, and New Delhi to Vishanbe. 
From there, I was able to drive the M41 all the way to Dejalaga, 20 miles northwest of Ismail Simoni. Climbers usually start their ascent of Ismail Simoni from a base camp in Moskvina Glade, which can only be accessed by helicopter. I didn't need to go that high. I intended to walk 35 miles to the plane over the course of five days. The snow would be confined to the higher peaks, except maybe when I got up there to 6,000 feet, just maybe. I consciously did not prepare for a freak snowstorm, which, if it happened, might just kill me. I would also have problems if a private pilot I'd hired to drop supplies for me in the lowlands for the return hike screwed up or got detained. All my advanced research had made me mostly confident in Flight 70's exact location. If I didn't find it within 24 hours of getting to its elevation, though, I'd have to bag it. I couldn't explore any longer than I absolutely needed to. Every eight hours, the elements might bring something completely new. Nighttime temperatures in July in that area could dip below freezing. After two days of rest to deal with my jet lag, I began my hike. I walked and I snapped photographs and the weather held. On the third day, I saw Ismail Simoni in the far distance, snow-capped, bleak and beautiful. But God, was I glad not to have to get that far. When the sun disappeared and the sky went the color of ash, it looked like a silent God promising nothing but death. My isolation was of a kind I'd never really experienced, and on the fourth night, huddled in my tent in the trees that dotted the rocky lowlands, it seemed to engulf me all at once. I was kicking dirt over the fire I'd built outside my tent. It was about two in the morning. I'd been living in that silence for three days and nights, but now truly disturbing images suddenly came unbidden into my mind. They'd broached my mental defenses before, ever since I read about Flight 70. But out there, just miles from the crash site after flying across the world, they were infinitely more vivid. I thought about the silence of more than 2,000 nights there inside that broken fuselage as the bodies decomposed. There would have been visitors to it of an inhuman kind. Scavengers, dragging the bodies out one by one, maybe over the course of weeks, months, in the silence. And after there was nothing left to take and only bones remaining, that tomb would have begun to age meaninglessly, rusting, rotting. If I were to just sit inside there, in an intact seat maybe, what could be heard, I wondered. Just wind, rain, snow, the slow drip of moisture. Insects would have crawled over the wreckage on summer nights, devouring what the mammals didn't want. My reverie was broken by the sound of something moving in the woods. It stood out only because it didn't have the random scurrying or galloping aspect I was used to. It sounded like a cautious shift a conscious resettling in a slightly different place. And I think I lost a half hour's sleep playing it back in my mind again and again. I spent at least two hours a day resting and calculating, going very carefully over my maps. And I figured I'd begin my ascent to the plane from my last camp around midday on July 9th. But the terrain was a wild card, and I had to detour around a wide stream that had unpredictably overflowed, creating an impassable cutoff I had to spend hours negotiating. And so at about dusk, I was faced with the choice of making the final ascent in the dark or waiting until dawn. I won't lie, I was too excited to wait. I had a powerful headlamp, so the darkness wasn't going to deter me. Neither would the cold, as the temperature hovered right around 38 degrees, which would drop to about the freezing point higher up. A mountaineer of my acquaintance who had hiked through the Pamirs in the early 80s had given me his maps, and they had proved terrifically accurate. Getting to about 6,000 feet wasn't so much about physical endurance and acclimating. Altitude sickness doesn't affect me so much until I get up over 8,000. 
The problem here was maneuvering up the rocks in the dark without slipping. I didn't need any hooks or ropes, just good climbing boots. But I did have to constantly move with my hands pressed against the rocks to maintain my balance. I'm a lot of things, but I'm not a true mountain climber. So there were a couple of points where when I looked back and down, I got nervous. There finally came that exciting but frustrating point where I was where I thought I needed to be, and it was just a matter of covering ground in different directions to see if I could spot something. It was about one in the morning, a starry sky overhead. The wind was a little worse than I thought, and I was very cold. I saw no wildlife of note, but I was equipped to deal with anything hostile if I had to. At half past two, when I'd started to become truly frustrated and perpetually out of breath, I looked up a slope on the east side of the mountain and saw some small structure jutting out over the top of a ridge high above me. I made my way carefully up to a place where the rocks leveled off somewhat, and that's when I saw what could only have been the tail of the plane up ahead, lying on its side. The shape was unmistakable, even in the dark. The slope wasn't much more than 30 degrees, so if I was careful, I could walk without having to hunch over and brace myself on anything. There were still a few trees scattered around, and sometimes I grabbed one to hoist myself forward, or just stop and rest and catch my breath. I arrived at the crash site, a stretch of ground representing a long groove in the valley. Perhaps the pilot had aimed for it in a desperate attempt to land. I spent an hour circling the plane, which looked to have broken apart in four distinct pieces, with much smaller parts lying here and there. Every time I thought I had a grasp on the radius of the site, I was wrong. The nose containing the cockpit was missing entirely. I would look for it later, as the satellite images had revealed that part had skidded a good bit further than the rest. Much of the exterior was charred almost black. I could read only the last three letters of the name of the airline printed on the side of the fuselage. One wing, almost entirely intact, had slid down the rocks and gotten snarled in the trees. The other seemed to have crumpled upon impact and partially disintegrated. The assumption had been that in the savage cold and snow, any passengers who might have survived would have remained inside for protection. I could see why, though, from the grainy photographs that were taken from high above in October of 1992, that it had been assumed no one could have made it out of the fiery wreckage alive. I took pictures, about 50, just of the plane's exterior, moving slowly around to get every angle. It wasn't until I got to the opposite side of the plane, looking at it from the north, that my impression of what had happened here suddenly changed. A hole about two feet wide and about four feet high had been punched into the side of the longest piece of intact fuselage. Probably when the plane came into contact with some jutting rocks and the wing was torn away. But there was something covering the hole. It was a blanket, a blue blanket. It had been affixed to the plane just above the hole with electrical tape that was still, somehow, doing its job. This made it immediately apparent to me that not only had someone survived, but that they survived long enough to fashion some protection from the elements there, inside that tomb. I almost missed the writing above the blanket because I hadn't been tilting my headlamp over wide enough an area. Someone had written something very faintly on the white metal in letters about eight inches high over this crude, accidental entrance into the plane. I had to get very close to read it. It was so faint. It seemed to be either lipstick or red crayon, the letters had been overlaid with a sheen of clear packing tape, as if the writer had known that without it, the elements would wash away the writing quickly. The words there read, Halloween Haunted House. Admission, $3. I backed away, rusting again. Really, I was just staving off the inevitable. 
I thought I had mentally steeled myself for entry into the plane and whatever I might see there, but this visual, those words, kept me out. How long might they have lived, I thought, to transition from a mode of pure survival into a mindset that had spawned some kind of gallows humor. I sat for a moment on the rocks, less than ten feet from the hole. My conscience tried to shut me down, but I wouldn't let it. I had come too far and spent too much. Before I tell this next part, I do want whoever's listening to this just to hear a bit of audio I took out there, beside the plane, because I just don't think you can understand how alone I felt, unless you have some kind of actual taste of that place. I pushed the blue blanket aside and maneuvered carefully through the crack into the fuselage, trying not to rip my jacket, pants, or flesh on jagged, protruding metal shards. Enough air had gotten into this section on a consistent basis, so it wasn't as stuffy as I thought it might be. There were tiny cracks in the metal frame in several places. There was no particular odor in there except of simple mustiness. Immediately, my headlamp showed me something dangling right in front of my face, at eye level. It was an index card, about three by five inches, hung from the ceiling of the craft by a piece of what I thought was dental flaws. Something was written on it. I rubbed the letters and came to the conclusion that they were done in permanent black marker, fading year by year. They read, in all capital letters, WARNING! Exclamation point. In this haunted house you may see terrifying things. I warned you! Exclamation point. Please leave your admission fee in the box and start at the back. Happy Halloween! Signed, Lawrence Braid, with a crude drawing of a jack-o'-lantern beside the signature. Lawrence Braid, I knew, had been one of the three Americans on board the plane, an engineer for the Red Cross. I took in the entire space. The floor was tilted as this part of the plane had settled at an angle, but it wasn't quite dramatic enough to make movement difficult. About twelve rows of seats, about a third of them had been smashed into nothingness. The survivor, or survivors, of Flight 70 likely dragged the fatalities out and hopefully buried them. But there was one body remaining in one of the intact window seats. I will not much describe its condition here, except to say it had been almost six years. The body was slumped down, leaning against the window. I couldn't even tell if it was male or female. The victim was wearing a heavy winter coat. Its lower jaw was gone. The other signs Lawrence Braid had left behind here were positioned in strategic places inside the cramped section of the fuselage. The first one was taped to the bathroom door against the rear wall, in the galley where the flight attendants would have sat. I moved down the aisle carefully, stepping over a suitcase and a backpack and a stack of blankets. This is the bathroom where I hid, Braid had written on the card. It probably saved my life. I heard the beginnings of the commotion from inside it and cowered here. After that, I don't remember anything until I woke up with someone else's blood in my eyes and snow falling on my face. Now, look to your right for a surprise in seat 38L! Exclamation. The door to the bathroom had a deep crack running from top to bottom and was too difficult to open without forcing it loudly, and I felt that to make noise would frighten me more than I already was. So I left it alone, turned around, and moved over to row 38. This body was laid out across three seats, 
two of the armrests having been broken off at some point. This one was entirely a charred skeleton. Whatever fire had claimed it had thinned away much of its bones, especially around the ribcage. Someone had encased that ribcage in a mud-crusted pilot's jacket and had propped a pilot's hat on its skull. Its right hand had been arranged so that it seemed to be gripping something. It was a spiral-bound textbook of some kind, burned half away by fire. I could read some of the lettering on the cover, but not enough to identify the book. The index card, taped to the skeleton's hat, filled in the details. Meet your flight captain, the writing said. Boo! Exclamation point. It's not easy to land a plane with a crazy hijacker on board in lousy weather over a mountain range with wind gusts causing turbulence so bad that people were bouncing and shouting. I salute you, Captain Tatosov. Hope this flight manual I found in the cockpit detailing procedures for emergency situations will come in handy in the next world. The cockpit, yes. Braid had brought this back from the plane's nose then, a place I had yet to explore. I moved on through this haunted house, wondering at what point Braid had gone completely insane, if he'd been the only one left alive when he began his Halloween project, or if he'd had help. The third exhibit I discovered was nothing more than a letter Braid had found in someone's luggage, someone he did not know. It had survived the crash almost entirely intact. He had sealed it up inside a plastic bag and now invited me, the haunted house's only guest, to remove it from the cheap netting on the back of the aisle seat in row 34R and read it. I had to translate it much later from the photographs I took of it. The letter was essentially a confession by one of the passengers on board to his mistress in Tascant detailing how he had murdered his wife the week before and burned their house down to cover the tracks. Just six days later, it turned out, this man, too, would be surrounded by fire. I'll be with you soon, darling, he concluded his letter. We're free. Is there anyone on this plane who wasn't trying to kill people? Lawrence Braid's note chested. The end of the note directed me toward the front of this section of the plane, where the gaping hole created when it had separated from the front quarter had been blocked off by anything and everything that could be collected or fashioned by human hands. Suitcases, pillows, beverage carts, window curtains, and especially seats uprooted from the floor. The wall was ramshackle but effective. Thin wisps of air wound through its flaws and ruffled my hair ever so slightly. Propped against the mounds of debris that had become a wall was another skeleton. An orange sweater hung loosely around its ribcage. Its head was missing. But no, there it was, placed neatly between the skeleton's crossed legs. The headlamp beam created dancing shadows in its eye sockets. I spotted another index card taped near this display, fastened to a suitcase. Beside the card was a Polaroid, a slightly out-of-focus and messily framed shot of a young man with long black hair looking at a frame. It was obviously taken when the plane was still aloft. And here is your hijacker, the index card read. He certainly wishes he had died in the crash, because when we four survivors started to lose our minds, we got pretty mad. There was a little torture, I'm afraid. The man from Southampton liked to hear him scream. The head was removed post-mortem, though. Or was it? If you wish to see the annex and the last exhibit on our tour, please leave an additional dollar in the box. It's worth it exclamation point. I did not leave a dollar inside the box, which was an empty tin of mints with an open lid. 
The air outside the fuselage felt startlingly fresh after my 20 minutes inside the tomb. I breathed in and out, looking up at the stars. I scrolled through the photos on my camera to make sure I'd gotten everything. These represented the tainted fortune I was bound to make when I got back home. The other parts of the plane couldn't realistically be entered. They were burned too badly. I walked toward a relatively flat section of the rocky gorge where there were a few more trees. The nose of the plane couldn't be very far away, less than 200 yards. And it was indeed where I thought it would be. The problem would be getting to it. It had settled in the trees about 50 yards down a slope so steep that it wasn't clear to me how Lawrence Braid or anyone else could have reached it safely with snow and ice in these mountains. If I had learned anything in my years doing foolishly adventurous things, though, it's that where there is a will, there is a way. And to someone driven half insane by fear, hunger, and despair, as Braid had likely been, the 45-degree slope I was looking at would have merely presented the possibility of a sudden and merciful death. I secured my camera in my backpack and then put it back on myself on the wrong side of my torso so that it pressed very awkwardly against my chest. I sat down on the rocks, braced my hands behind me, and began to scoot down, leaning way back to even out my weight. I skidded a little almost immediately and forced myself to stop and think about each short section of rock that would take me down. I then progressed somewhat blindly, as lifting my head and curving my neck to see exactly where I was going was too great a constant strain on my muscles. It was slow going, feeling my way down, scraping my back against the rock, while the weight of my pack felt like it was pinning my overworked lungs. But I got there. I finally felt the tips of my boots press against the side of the aircraft's nose. It was angled perpendicular to me, so the elements would have spared the contents of the cockpit for a while, at least somewhat. I was able to maneuver slowly around to the open side, just ten feet off to the right from that great wound in the plane's structure, a thin but possibly deadly dark crevasse beckoned to me from a split in the terrain. Whether it was three feet or thirty feet deep, I couldn't tell. There was not much to the space before me. Room enough for the flight crew, that was about it. The structure had been punctured on the left side, and one of the pilot's seats was totally mangled. The windshield was shattered, but mostly intact. No bodies. A final index card had been taped to the floor here, in front of the throttle levers. And it was flanked by two photographs on one side, two on the other. Polaroids again. I had to look at them for a very long time to understand them. I was here, the card read. It was the third night after everyone else was dead. I broke two toes sliding on the ice toward the nose. I looked up and saw the light coming over the west ridge. It was green. Then the whole sky went to that color all at once, and it began to ripple. It was beautiful and terrifying. There were voices that weren't human. But they didn't take me. L.B. The Polaroids illustrated the note in a fashion so crude that you could almost argue that these were merely defective prints. Two were nothing more than an indistinct sea of a strangely textured green color, while the third showed the same thing but at least had two trees in the foreground for context, so that I did believe I was looking at a corrupted night sky. The edge of the fourth photo seemed to have captured part of a vast, dark object thinly concealed within the layer of rippling green atmosphere that had replaced the sky. But what the object was would have been complete conjecture, 
as it offered no detail beyond a blockiness of shape. Like the other pictures and documents on Lawrence Braid's tour, I photographed these multiple times and then left them exactly where they were. I exited the nose of the aircraft and sat securely on its torn open edge, tucking the camera back into my pack for the ascent back up the slope. I wondered when Braid had died and exactly how. It would have required precious physical and mental energy to create his haunted house. From about 120 yards beyond the crest of the slope, there came the sound of something heavy banging twice against the fuselage of the airplane. The tinniness of the sound clanged and cracked against the rocks. Even in my exhausted state, my mind was processing everything quickly enough to flash immediately back to the night before, sitting at my camp after extinguishing the fire and hearing something shift in the woods, a sound less than two seconds in duration but which somehow suggested intent. I got moving. There were two indentations in the rock slope well-placed so as to allow my legs a good first upward push. As cold as it was, the rock was bone dry, and I had only one scary moment when my right foot gave and the rest of my body slipped downward two feet, my chin bumping the rock painfully. I waited till my heartbeat slowed and continued my climb. Soon enough, I was on my feet again, standing and staring at the wreckage in the distance. I stood in the dark and waited. I would need to put my warmer, less malleable gloves on soon. My fingers were starting to become painfully cold and stiff. I moved toward the plane, wondering if I would have the courage, if the source of the sound did not reveal itself, to go back inside it. Do it again, I said to the phantom noisemaker as I circled the area, maybe out loud, I don't know. Do it again. I called out very loudly to anyone who might be around in the shadows. No response. When I was within five feet of the wrecked opening of the craft from which I had originally emerged, the glow of my headlamp sputtered momentarily as the batteries fought the cold, and then it lit up a pair of legs dangling from above the opening, legs leading up to a living torso belonging to a stranger sitting atop the plane. In an instant, that shocking visual was gone. And I realized it wasn't legs I was looking at. It was only two deep scrapes in the fuselage, forming an inverted V, which I had actually been aware of before. My imagination had only succumbed now to this hideous illusion when dark had suddenly erupted in light. That was what decided me against entering the plane again. With my mental state the way it was, I was now afraid I might start screaming and never stop. The sound... I had heard, I rationalized, out of a combination of exhaustion, cold, the muddying effects of altitude, and simple cowardice, must not have been what I thought it was. I had likely disturbed something inside the plane which caused a later unbalancing of metal components, a subsidence. To the teetering Jack LeDrew of that moment, it made perfect sense. I took no more photographs. Instead, I began to move back to the route that had brought me to the crash site. I turned around exactly once to take in one final time the grim side of Flight 70, struck by the bizarre majesty of it, this massive, proud machine and wonder of technology that had been slain by one person, reduced first to a bloody, fire-chewed parody of itself, but slowly transformed into a solemn monument. Five minutes later, moving far less carefully than I should have, I was already a hundred yards down the curving route through the rocks when someone struck the fuselage with a heavy object once again, two times, a sound almost lost in the wind around me. I remember turning 
and rooting myself in place, as if bracing for the sight I suspected might be soon to come. I became part of the landscape, a fixed feature, like the distressed trees that struggled in it. I was on relatively level ground. Whatever might approach me would have only one path to do it, and they would have to emerge directly into my headlamp beam, warning me of their presence from twenty yards away. And so he came. Not some hunched, huddled form in rags, beaten down by years of deprivation. He walked slowly into the beam with silent, stoic composure. He wore a dark green sweater and tan pants under a thick and oversized denim jacket, a knit cap on his head. He was bearded very tall. He looked at me with only mild, curiosity, as if he had been expecting me since 1992. He came to within just a few yards of me. Then he extended a shaky right hand, in which he gripped a small, empty mince tin, its lid open. You didn't pay, Lawrence Braid said to me. Of the salvage operation that was finally mounted just days after I stumbled out of the mountains and went to the authorities with what I knew, I have nothing to add that can't be found through publicly available sources. It's just details, the sad administrative part of a lurid story. What matters is this, that they never found the only long-term survivor of the crash who disappeared into the Pamirs without speaking one word to me beyond the three he had offered there within walking distance of the wreckage. He had turned away and walked serenely into the darkness, and he did not follow me out of the wilderness. I moved alone back towards Dajal again. Each night after crushing my campfire, I waited waited for the sound of movement in the woods around my succession of temporary shelters. Each night I lay down frightened to fall asleep because the nightmares that gripped me got worse and worse. In every one of them I went down with Flight 70, crushed upon impact. If you're wondering, yes, I went ahead and sold my photographs of the Halloween haunted house attraction to the highest bidder. Today, the route I took to the crash site is wildly over-traveled by hikers and climbers because Lawrence Braid, once known only as a dedicated relief worker lending aid to others in a crisis, has metamorphosed into a wilderness legend of whom the curious and the greedy seek any physical sign. At night, they wait in the cold and the snow and the heat and the rain, for that green light to ripple in the sky and hearken the return of, well, whatever it was that Braid believed he saw as he cowered in the broken cockpit of the aircraft. All the alleged sightings of Braid since 1998 are unreliable and unconfirmed, as even mine was. Sometimes I think the only way he could never have been found out there by now is that he did indeed perish, the last one to die, shortly after completing work on his attraction, probably. I should have taken that little mince box out of his extended hand for proof, just to confirm to myself as I get old that I had seen him standing there in front of me. That's what I should have done. Steffi was only working at Steiden Strauer's Donuts because she wanted to buy a Microsoft Zune. Steffi was a techie 
And the Microsoft Zune was allegedly going to be the digital music player that wiped the iPod off the map. Stiden Strauer's was a lousy enough place to make money anyway, but it was made worse because she could only get the overnight shift, 10 to 6. The shop was all the way out on Red Cobb Road, and nobody came in that late. She would have maybe 10 customers all night, but old Mr. Stiden Strauer believed in tradition, so the overnight shift stayed. All the donuts were more stale than even normal by then. The biggest problem for Steffi, though, was a customer named Mr. Prusalius. He was even older than Mr. Steidenstrauer, and tiny and hunched over, with weirdly long strands of hair going down to the collar of his coat. He would come in every three nights or so, and he always wanted to buy whatever donuts were left on the racks. All of them, every single one. But he didn't want anything that was not a donut. So... No turnovers, no bear claws, and certainly not any lemon gertners, which were generally considered by everyone in the area to be the worst thing Steidenstrauer sold, now entering their 50th year of being scorned by the customers. Steffi would put all the donuts, only a few dozen were left by the time Mr. Prusalius hobbled in at about 3 a.m., into floppy cardboard boxes, Give the old man a 20% discount, and off he would go with a weird smile. Steffi didn't like being alone with him in the shop, which was always the case. Hutchie, the sullen teenager who made the donuts, was long gone by the time she came in for her shift, and the two early evening cashiers left at 11. One time, Steffi finally asked Mr. Prusalius what he did with all these donuts. I was wondering when you'd ask me that, he'd said, grinning. Who doesn't like a donut? That didn't seem like much of an answer to Steffi. When she told him she'd be glad to throw the last of the turnovers, bear claws, and lemon gertners into a floppy box for free, since no one had any use for them at three in the morning, he shook his old head. Oh, no, he said to her. The donuts don't get eaten, you see. It's the holes that are important. He lifted an old-fashioned with chocolate icing up to his eye and peeked at her through it. These holes, he croaked, are the perfect size. With that, he'd scooped up the floppy boxes full of stale donuts and crept out the front door, hobbling across the parking lot and down the road, where no cars passed by, where there was just the wind wafting over the lonely pavement and into the woods beyond. For eight weeks that went on. Then, one December night, when it had been almost two hours since the last customer had come through the door, in came Mr. Prusalius once again. "'I'll take what's left of the donuts, please,' he said as usual. But... There were only two left that night on the racks. Hutchie had flipped his ATV during his 15-minute break that afternoon and rolled his ankle, and it had to go home. So there weren't as many donuts made as usual. Steffi said she was sorry. You can have these two for free, she offered hopefully. Mr. Prusalius' eyes went wide and began to tremble. But that's not enough holes, he whimpered scanning the racks frantically as if more donuts were just going to materialize out of nowhere. What will I tell? But here he trailed off. His face got redder and redder. Steffi started to back away from the counter. Then Mr. Prusalius put his hands to his mostly bald head, turned, and stumbled out the door into the freezing night. A horrid chill blew in. The old man crossed the parking lot and vanished into the darkness. For the first time, sans donuts. Well, that was something I didn't need to experience, Steffi said to herself when he was gone. She wiped down the counter and leaned on it, trying to calm herself. This job could not end soon enough. She was so close to being able to afford a Microsoft Zune. Then it was off to college and the next most exciting phase of her life. But she couldn't seem to settle herself after the incident. She became hyper-aware of the clock, 
ticking on the wall above her, the clock that had been hanging there since 1971. She listened to the wind outside and watched it ruffle the grass beside lonely Red Cob Road. She became more and more nervous. At 3.15, the front door opened once more and the draft rushed in. Steffi looked up to see a tall man standing there. Very, very tall. He was wrapped in a black raincoat and wore a black hat. His face was pale, so incredibly pale. His bony feet were bare, totally bare, against store policy. His corneas were tiny, tiny, and they were bright green. When he got close enough to the counter, Steffi's heart almost stopped. There was what looked like mist or smoke curling around the man's shoulders and head. It wasn't rising, though. It was just dwelling around him. He smelled musty, like a dead grandfather's suit found in an attic. Where are the holes? This awful man whispered. Puselius had none. Give them to me. Steffi put a hand to her chest to control the sudden hitch in her breathing. It's like I told him, she said. Hachi didn't make enough donuts. The tall man leaned over the counter. His tiny, tiny, bright green corneas became nothing more than little dots, no bigger than the dots over the eyes if you wrote the word shrieking on a napkin. I need holes, he said. Without enough holes, I can't see through to the other side. That was it. Steffi lost it. She slammed her hand down on a tray beside her and lifted from it a rock-hard, two-day-old lemon Gertner and hurled it at the terrible man. It struck him right between the eyes, and he howled, shocked at her aggression. It was safe to say that no one had ever dared strike him with stale pastry. He put his pale hands to his face and let out a long, high-pitched snarl that didn't sound human. He spun around and seemed to float toward the door, the mist or smoke swirling even faster around him. The door opened without him even touching it. Then he was out and into the parking lot. But instead of crossing it, his whole body just melted into the dark night, with little gray tendrils of what had embraced him dissolving in the air. The front door remained open. Only when she became so cold that her teeth began to chatter did Steffi go to it and pull it shut. Steffi called her father, waking him up, and had him come pick her up from the shop right then and there. She left Steidenstrauer's Donuts and never went back. She bought her Microsoft Zune, and you know what? She really enjoyed listening to her music on it. By the time she was 30, Steffi was executive vice president in charge of research and development at one of the biggest tech companies in Europe. She still does like to eat a good donut from time to time. Hey, who doesn't like a good donut?